we're going to cover now is uh, Guelphs and Ghibellines. This is uh, Medieval Battles in Italy. Uh, Marco has actually covered a game from this series, the same designer, although by a different publisher. This was published by uh, Europa Simulation. Um, the designer here, someone I don't know. And I don't know if he's done anything other than this. Uh, Pirganero Federico. Federico. Uh, and the, uh, the design elements from it are very heavily drawn from uh, the Men of Iron, Infidel, and uh, although I certainly haven't gotten to it yet, the Blood and Roses. Um, from the Men of Iron series. So you're going to see very similar types of rules, but uh, part of what I'm thinking, just from reading the rules, I haven't played it yet, is that this may be sort of the pinnacle of that design philosophy. Uh, Men of Iron had, a, had an ideal of, of keeping things a little simpler than the Great Battles of History, but what I was always looking for was, anyway, when I played Men of Iron, my thought was, oh, I wish this was more like Great Battles of History. Well. This one takes that Men of Iron uh, system, and it is very much the core system, and then adds to it uh, a little bit uh, more of a layer of detail, etc. Anyway, what you get in the game, um, you're going to get three battles. This map is not double-sided. Uh, there's a double-sided map here. There's counters for each battle. Um, nice large size hexes and counters. Really, really beautiful map. You can't see this but the uh, texture, the quality of the map is very heavy uh, stock for a map. Um, there are pluses and minuses to that. You can see kind of the crease lines. If, if you use Plexi, hey, it doesn't matter what the quality of the map is. If you don't use Plexi, these heavier stock maps tend to pooch a little bit more, um, but there's no gloss to it, which actually helps it lie flat a little better. Uh, but you can see it got some crinkling here from the back folding oper operation. Um, get your player aid chart, which is going to be your terrain effects on one side, your combat tables on the other. You got this little activation chart. Uh, Men of Iron had tracks kind of like this, but these are more, there's something very interesting going on here. Essentially, uh, I'll let you know it secretly because I'm going to go through the rules uh, in, in some depth here because it is a new game to me. I've only read them once. But essentially, each leader is going to have a certain number of activations that he can do once he's enabled to, to take an action. And then when he does that, it, it, the number of activations he has for the next time he activates goes down by one, and so on. Um, that uh, definitely makes it more, it, it puts some pressure on you to fight the battle uh, rather than do a lot of maneuvering. And that's sort of the intention behind it. Now somewhere, uh, there's gotta be more of these. I got these. So you have victory points and victory levels. As you accumulate victory points, you will be getting possible levels. Um, this order points marker, which is what I really want here. And, We'll get into a little bit of the, or a lot, of the rules as we go. Um, so, like Men of Iron, well, let's look at uh, the counters first. So we've got a couple of different kinds of counters. Uh, we have our regular units, which have sort of a cohesion quality, uh, cohesion rating in it. And you're going to take hits against that, kind of like in Great Battles of History. Again. A little bit more detail in here. You have an armor rating, which is either going to be medium, light, and there's also heavies kicking around uh, for the knights. Uh, you also have guys with no armor. Um, units are color-coded for their command. So this unit is one command. These red guys on yellow are another. You know, we got two more here. Then we got the uh, blue ones. I think these are the Guelphs. Uh, Yes, these are the gloves here. Um, each battle is going to have two sets of uh, setup. Uh, basically, you can do it as a set piece battle, or you can do it as kind of a meeting engagement, uh, giving you a little bit more room to uh, engage the enemy. 
much as I love doing purely historical things, I do want to play around with the meeting engagement rules. They look more exciting to me, so I'm going to actually even start with that. Neither the historical nor the meeting engagement give me really rigid setup instructions. They're kind of like, hey, here's a box, fill it with your units. You know, you got to figure out what you want in the front and what you want in the back. And it's probably not too hard. In this case, I have an infantry unit. I have some uh, archers here. You can see they have little arrows. I believe the red means they're crossbow because that goes with the picture. There are also regular bowmen who I think have a black arrow and a picture of a regular bowman. Uh, you have leaders who have two values on them, and I'm going to have to look that up kind of. Uh, let's see. The lower left marker is their combat bonus. The lower right is going to be their command range. And they're also going to be heroes who just give a combat bonus and don't have a command uh, radius. And then if you lose your leader, you have a lower rank or a lower able uh, uh, subordinate who would take his place. Um, we've already talked about the command markers here. And each leader has his own command capacity. Uh, some units are going to have standards, which are treated kind of like a personality, but uh, they provide both a rallying functionality and also a victory point cost if you lose the standard. You have some little number markers here to mark your cohesion hits. Um, cleverly, the game was they, they printed the game in in one with one set of counter set uh, sheets one set I well one would guess that the map had to be translated because you've got the uh, tables built into the map in English uh, but the counter sheets they didn't have to do that so they kept these terms like karika for charge uh, well I don't know attacks in English there, so I don't know. Uh, that was my assumption because they kept uh, a number of terms in the game in Italian, but it doesn't look like, uh, looks like they made different counter sheets for different languages, or they used generally in English language for that and just decided to use it to, uh, Italian words for a few key issues. Okay, so the base uh, play of this game is one person gets an activation and he gets to select one of his commands and move it. And he's only going to be allowed to give orders to a number of units equal to his uh, command chart. So this guy here is only going to be able to give nine orders. Now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's about half his unit. He's not going to be able to use his whole unit. So you're not going to see these units slicing across the map. Now there's special rules for the for the uh, prequel to the battle, the, the meeting engagement part that uh, modify that and you have to uh, cope with those as well but I'm, I'm talking about the basic game here um, and then after you activate you have the right to try to continue with one of your uh, leaders it can be any of your leaders and let me see how you roll that uh, if you roll less than the current command capacity the number that you're on here you'll get an activation now after you complete an activation of any kind your little thing goes down by one um, you're not allowed to activate the same leader more than twice in a row. And we've got a little marker that I had on the board. First activation, when I first start moving that leader, second activation, and now I can't roll for a continuation on him. But I can roll on another leader. And I could do that anyway. I mean, I don't have to move my one leader twice. Now, if I successfully get a continuation, if I... If I roll for a continuation, I lose a point off the track. If I successfully get one, my opponent can try to roll once, and this is going to be using six-sided dice, not ten-siders. There's another difference in the system. Uh, can roll once to try to get an interruptio, or an interruption. Uh, preemptions, whatever you want to say. And if I get the selected uh, roll is less than that captain's command capacity, and you can see these command capacities are quite high. Um, but I'm going to be rolling two dice against it. So there is, as, as that goes down, it becomes very easy to fail. Um, the difference between an interruption and a continuation is that if I get control through an interruption, I only get half as many points 
as I would get for a continuation. And I still have to pay a mark on the track. So you probably want to withhold those because they're not going to allow you to move to use as many of your units. And the key to what you use with your units. Um, okay, so first you have to uh, you, you assign orders to the units using your command capacity, which is this point. So if I have nine, I could put the orders points here on nine, this drops down, and now I have nine orders to give to individual different units. Most orders are going to cost me one thing, and I'll go quickly over what they are. Move and attack. Uh, you can move up to your full movement allowance, and if you end adjacent to a unit, you can put a little marker saying, I'm going to attack this guy, and you point to which unit you're going to attack. Uh, fire. If you've got a missile unit, you can give it an order to uh, fire. It's allowed to shift up to one facing. Facing is important in this game. Uh, one vertex in facing before it fires. If it does so, though, it's going to get a penalty on the fire chart, which maybe it's here. Yeah. Change facing is listed on the fire chart table. And I think these tables are all repeated on here, so the guy, if somebody's sitting over there, they can have one set of charts. The other guy can have the other. Of course, the movement charts are not repeated, so it's not that big a bonus. Um, basically, the area across the river is out of play. A bunch of map that's wasted. It's kind of attractive, though, to give you know the terrain here along with the charts and tables instead of some SPI-style big block of charts and tables that cuts into everything. And you know, <laughs> that the map is very attractive, in my opinion. Yeah, but you can see for yourself. Um, okay, next order is a reorganization. If you have disrupted a uh, disrupted unit that's not adjacent to an enemy, and disruption is going to be marked by a unit being flipped over, you can unflip it to the undisrupted. There's a little D to indicate it's disrupted. Uh, withdraw. So this is the only way that you can leave an enemy zone of control. Uh, you back up, basically, into one of your empty rear hexes, and you maintain your facing. And you can actually stumble backwards into some other zone of control. That probably doesn't sound like a good idea. Uh, the Krika is your charge. A cab that's not disrupted can get this order, and it must move at least one hex and must attack the enemy unit. And there's little charge markers with an arrow of their own to indicate that, that there's going to be that kind of attack. Finally, there's the echelon. Cav can do this. So if you have two ranks of cav and you want to get the front rank out, um, you can swap a with a unit directly behind it using this order. I don't believe it allows an attack. This is going to cost you two of your order points uh, to do because you're commanding two different units. There's some special orders. Uh, recovery and rally. And unfortunately, rally... It's not covered here. These are going to cost you all of your operations points, however, or orders points, however many you have at that point, at the beginning of your action. Um, a recovery allows your units, if, you're none, if your units are all um, not adjacent to an enemy, you can do this. And your command capacities marker has to be at least, has to be five or less and then your command capacity goes up equal to half a die roll. So this is how you recover your effectiveness for your units. Not sure where rally is. There don't seem to be any, uh, I don't remember any rules for rally. When units route, they leave the board. So I'm assuming that may be a little artifact from an earlier uh, design situation that's been cut from the game. Okay. Like I said, you have facing, the facings on the vertices, um, you have front, flank, and rear hexes, you can attack through the front, you can fire through the front, flanks and rears are important in case you're being attacked, some of the combat tables uh, are affected by that. Uh, facing changes for cav, it costs you one movement point, and you can, hey, I haven't got into movement yet, but we'll get to that in a moment. It costs you one movement point for a cav to change facing, and it can basically wheel around into any direction. For infantry, it costs one for every vertex that they move. These are, you know, fairly sturdy spear formations here. They're not going to move around very quickly. Uh, 
If somebody just moves into your flank or rear hex, you're allowed to do a reaction facing change, and I think that's only allowed to be one vertex. Yeah. Um, when you do so, you make a roll against the unit's current cohesion rating, which is going to be its base cohesion rating minus any hits that it's taken on it. Just like GBOH. And uh, if you roll higher than its cohesion, you're going to take a disruption effect. Now, disruption is going to further damage your cohesion, so <laughs> this is dangerous. Um, if foot moves onto calf doing this, you don't have to make a die roll. The calf gets a free facing change. And remember, calf gets the full facing, which is they can whip around. Um, if a moving unit is cav and the reacting unit is foot, the foot unit has a penalty of plus two to its die roll. It's unlikely to be able to swing around in time. Uh, zones of control, these are only going to be into your frontal hexes. Uh, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, we'll get to those. Uh, some units don't provide zones of control. For example, these little shield men who are with the archers. Um, and the effect is, well, it stops a unit that enters into an enemy zone of control. However, CAV can completely ignore foot zone of control. And personalities uh, can ignore zones of control for movement. Um, if you want to exit a zone of control, you have to do a withdrawal action. And if you exit from a missile capable unit, uh, you're going to take a reaction fire for that. In fact, I think when you enter it, you take one too, but that's what I thought. But maybe I'm... Yeah, you can take it if, you're, uh, if you enter into a zone of control too. It wouldn't make sense otherwise because the archers would be uh, meat. Okay. Movement allowances, they're not noted on the counter. Cav are going to have a movement allowance of five. Everything else has a movement allowance of three. And we have a cost for all the different types of uh, terrain here. For the most part, most of the stuff's clear, but we can look throughout. These little things aren't going to mean anything, but little buildings and villages, they don't look like they mean much. They bone a charge, though. Uh, the hills are going to cost you. Um... And I'm not sure what qualifies as a hill. So this is the intermediate level here. Oh no, intermediate level is where something's divided. I'm trying to see if there's something that I would call a hill. Um, see, it just looks darker. And I'm really not sure... What's up with that? Let's look at this. Cap moving or attacking into a hill hex is disrupted. Ah, maybe it's just this darker brown here. It's kind of hilltops or something. Let's see if we got something there. Hex 2706 on Benevenito. Well, let's see. We're not playing Benevenito. I wish uh, there was a better description of it. Okay, well here's Hex 2706 on Benevenito and it does not look like a hill. <laughs> so I don't know. Those represent, however, difficult to negotiation. 2706 on Benevenito. Is 2706 on this map, maybe? No. And this is Benevenito here. Oh no, this is... Uh, Saturday of Barnabas. What the hell? Ah, it's only a one-sided map. I thought it was two-sided. Let's see if we can see what this may look like. Okay, so this is a hill. I think it may be this brownish stuff that you can kind of see there. And I kind of see some here. I'm not sure. That could just be texture. It's not well described in the game. I'm just going to say if I see something that looks like texture, I'm going to charge you a little extra. 
for moving over it. It's going to uh, screw up charges and it's got some modifiers, I guess, to combat. Uh, and screws up gab. Uh, one. Attacker on lower terrain, attacker on higher terrain. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. One dash two. Uh, I don't know. I'll try to I'll try to guesstimate all that stuff, but the rules seemed very very clear and and you know as good as anything say GMT puts out in terms of just reading them. But now trying to look up this terrain effect, and it's not so clear. Okay, um, you can move through your own units as long as they're not adjacent to an enemy. But if they're engaged with an enemy, you cannot. And it costs extra movement to move through your own units, an extra movement point. Stacking, uh, you can't, uh, except for these special units, these small counters. Those can stack, and there may be something else. Uh, there's like a wagon that I think is a big counter. Missile fire, you're going to be firing out your front hexes. There's range by the different types of weapons. They're going to give you a value. Find the armor class of the target unit and the column for the type of uh, firing device or range. So I look up the armor and the type of thing, and I guess this is the range. So if I were firing a crossbow at range 2 against medium, I'd get a 13. I roll the two dice and add the net die roll modifier, and I'm going to have to do higher than that modifier to do damage to it. Gee, that sounds hard. Well, here are my modifiers. Target firing through flank, uh, rear, lower elevation. Penalties for uh, the fire, though. Pella Severi in the target hex reduces it. But, here's the biggie. The current uh, cohesion not the hits against it, but the amount it has less left of the firing unit gets added to the die roll. So there is some cap some possibility of hitting things with these. Now these bows are not going to be, you know, these are not English long bows here, and the crossbows aren't the same, you know, they're, they're, they're not the Genoese crossbows of that same era. These are all slightly weaker technology, whereas the swords and axes, there's not a lot that you can do there. Now, on the other side of this, the designer doesn't go into this, but armor was also not quite as heavy at this point. So you gotta keep that in mind too. Although perhaps in Italy, I know Italian armor developed a little faster uh, than some of the others. So you might see some heavier armor on the uh, knights, etc. Obviously the high nobility was always gonna have pretty much the best armor there was in Europe. But, uh, you know, the regulars might be a little better equipped in this than they would be, say, in, uh, you know, a battle during the Hundred Years' War. Um, okay. Whenever you fire, you get a little fired marker on you. Now, these don't last very long. Uh, if you're a bowman, they get removed at the end of whatever command is operating. Uh, ends its operation. So if there's a continuation, they get removed before that continuation happens, even if it's the same unit. If they're crossbowmen, they only, and, and also all units and crossbowmen, uh, get the fired markers removed at the beginning of their activation and at the end of the, their activation. So essentially they get to fire during their activation and once before their next activation. And that next activation could be, well, it could take forever to get there if you don't choose to try and or don't succeed. Uh, you got to worry a little bit about line of sight. You can't fire through your through uh, units. Uh, reaction fire. You get to be shot. You get to shoot at people uh, if they enter or exit your zone of control. There's no return fire. Uh, there was regular return fire in Men of Iron system, I believe. That's gone here. You're going to have to activate your archers if you want them to shoot back in those kind of cir circumstances. Uh, shock combat. Okay, once you, once you attack, you have an option. You know, once you move, you have an option to attack. And you mark the things you want to attack. And then what you're going to do for the shock combat resolution is... What do you compare? Eh, that's a good question. So you don't, the units all attack each other on the zero column to begin with. 
From there, though, you have column adjustments. So if you're attacking through a flank, you get three, uh, two columns to the right. Uh, if more than one unit is attacking the same enemy unit, you get shifts for that. Uh, cavalry charging, get a shift. Uh, disrupted units are a penalty. Your armor class of the defending player, well, the, the armor classes get compared to give you a shift uh, modifier there. There's a unit type, and this is cav, infantry, crossbowmen, and archers, which is going to uh, also a weapons comparison, essentially, that's going to give you another shift there. And then terrain might uh, give you shifts as well. Then there's die roll modifiers. You're going to be rolling two dice, but you take a penalty, well, you take a bonus equal to your cohesion rating. Now, basically... Uh, both sides get to modify this, so whoever's got the better cohesion gets a bonus in their favor. If you're attacking and an undisrupted enemy has you in his zone of control and it's not being attacked by anything, you're going to get a penalty for each of those. So there's kind of an incentive if you attack somewhere to attack all down the line and not, you know, uh, try to gang up on units, which would be kind of weird to tell you the truth, to gang up on units and then leave other ones alone. Uh, your leader has a uh, combat rating, which gets added directly into the battle. And then if you're defending with a Pala, uh, Palvasari, you get a, a, a modifier to that because of the defensive bonus behind that. You get a bigger one off of fire attacks. Someone's shooting at you and you have those shields. You're in good shape. Um, okay. What are the results here? The results are numbers. Uh, which are the number of cohesion hits that that person, attacker or defender, takes. Attacker first, defender second. And then there's also Ds for disrupted uh, results, which are going to flip you over. we got to talk a little bit more about disruption. I know we've hit it before, but, for example, archery does just a disruption. Um, finally, if there's a result in bald, that's going to force that, the defender to retreat. And if the defender has to retreat, okay, so like in a lot of these games that allow you to put multiple units in on what uh, on a combat like this, one of the attacking units and the defending unit, obviously, um, are declared the lead units, that one of the attacking units, the lead unit. And that's the unit that's going to advance into the hex, take the most casualties, and also it's where the defender has to retreat from. So when you have to retreat, you have to retreat directly away from the lead attacking unit. And then you're allowed a free facing change, da da da. If you're not allowed to retreat because of various, you know, zone, uh, because of impassable terrain or something, but not enemy zones, uh, you take an extra cohesion hit from that. If you take all your cohesion hits, if you take your whole rating and hits, you're routed and you come off the game and you count as uh, a dead unit, basically. Um, the attacking unit has to advance if the, hex is, if the attacked hex is cleared, and it has to be the lead unit if possible. Uh, disruption. So when you're disrupted, if you take an additional disruption after you already took one, you roll a die, and you're going to take a number of uh, cohesion hits equal to the difference between the die roll and your current cohesion rating, as long as this difference is greater than zero. Um, and you're going to be subtracting your current cohesion from the die roll result. So if you have good cohesion, you're not going to fall apart as quickly. Now, there's a minimum of one cohesion hit from this anytime you're disrupted, except uh, from disruption from shock combat. That does not have that minimum. But if you do take a disruption on top of another disruption, uh, you do still have to make that die roll for damage. Uh, cav. Okay, cav has this charge effect, and you're not going to be allowed to charge through certain terrain. By charge through certain terrain, it means if the attacking hex or the defending hex is going to be a terrain that's illicit, uh, you won't be allowed to make the charge. You could still attack them. Uh, now, when infantry crossbow or archers are charged, they have to make a roll for morale uh, before they do any reaction fire. If they roll greater than their CR, they take a disruption. 
and if they route, uh, the charging unit must advance into their hex. If you charge enemy cav, they have the right to try to counter charge you. Uh, if you charge them through one of their two frontal, frontal hexes, um, you make a roll against your, uh, your, your CR. I keep wanting to call it quality because, you know, it is. Uh, the counter charge is successful and it just turns into a normal attack. However, if you fail, you take a disruption. The echelon order, we already talked a little bit about that. Um, yes, you're allowed to attack, but you're not allowed to charge in echelon. People. Nothing too exciting here. They add a bonus to combat, as we mentioned. Um, they're going to... Okay, so uh, an actual Capitani, as opposed to a hero, is going to provide you with a range. So this guy has a radius of five that he can command his units. But like in some other uh, ancients and medieval type games, as long as units are in uh, contact with other units that are in command, they're okay of their same formation. So I don't really have to worry here. As long as I have one of this big formation in command, I'm fine. So you got a lot of flexibility there. Um, heroes are similar to Capitani, except they don't have a command uh, aspect, they just have a battle value. Now, the two of them have different uh, casualty systems, and I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, the Palavasari, these are, uh, sorry, Palavasari, these are uh, sh mobile shields, and uh, they basically don't take their own losses, but if the unit they're with gets routed, uh, or um, what? It's eliminated if alone in a hex, or if it, the unit is stacked with routes. And there's basically, in this scenario, it looks like one per uh, archer. That may not be the case for all formations, but for this one, it definitely is. Scenarios start with certain uh, battaglia in reserve. And the advantage of that is, when you take it out of reserve, all the other commands get an extra point in their activation marker. As long as you kind of do it voluntarily, and there are going to be restrictions on when you can voluntarily do it. If somebody attacks one of them, though, it comes out of reserve, it's usable then, um, but it provides no benefit. And taking it out of reserve is a command. It has to be a regular command. It can't be a continuation. It can't be an interruption. How do you get regular commands? Well, when the other guy passes, basically. So if you want to press the battle with what you got on the field, nothing's coming out of reserve unless you fail a continuation. That counts kind of like a pass too, right? Because you got to roll the die for these things. So that immediately passes to the other person with a fair. So yes, it will eventually bubble down and you will get chances to, to activate your reserves. And then you do that as an action. Um, okay, victory in this is kind of cool. Uh, you get victory points for things you kill. And basically, each cohesion hit on cav gives you a victory point, and you get another one when it routes. And then uh, infantry archers and crossbowmen are worth two when they route. The capitano is going to be worth a d6 times his combat value when he routes. Heroes are just going to be a d6. And the standard is going to be a whole victory level. Now, that's something different. Because as you collect victory points, you're going to reach different victory levels. Uh, you start at the zero marker on the victory level chart. Each player will have their own little marker here. And they'll also have victory points running up there. And when the victory level... Uh, so that each scenario is going to have a value that you have to reach in victory points to boost yourself another victory level. And when the victory level reaches at least two, um, after any activation of a friendly Capitano, you roll two dice. If you get equal to or less than the current victory level, you get to move it up another space on the victory track. Uh, once somebody reaches 12 victory level, the game is over and they've won. So, you want to get a quick jump in this game, there's no question. However, if you end up rolling for continuum or interrupt, and it's higher than the sum of all the command capacity of the two released 
Capitani of both sides in the highest position on the chart. So at the beginning, we're going to be starting around nine each. You're not going to roll an 18 or higher, but when it gets, as the armies begin to tire, it's possible that they will just stop fighting. Uh, and so if you roll higher than the sum of their, uh, their highest active leaders, uh, you get that. Okay, so for the scenarios, you're going to have um, two different types, the battle scenarios and the free setup, which really to me is just, it's still fairly historical. It's just, uh, you know, you're starting at an earlier point. You're going to be allowed to deploy your troops. It's not like set your troops up wherever you like. It's you actually have to bring them on the ba a battlefield. And I like games that cover that. It's going to make it a little longer, but I think it'll be more fun. So under the historical, you're just going to have a uh, little boxes where all the units kind of go. By a box, this is handled by the four end corners, right? And defined as such, and then I can put all my units in there from that. Um, there's gonna be an activation, somebody who's gonna start the game, that's pre-assigned. There's gonna be a set of reserves. Any scenarios that are in reserves have to be released in order uh, to actually move. Uh, there's victory conditions, and then any special roles. The free s setup scenario, this is, like I said, more interesting to me. Um, so everything's going to be set up initially in reserve. I can read this as carefully as I should have. Uh, everything's set up initially, and then we're going to be marching towards the battlefield uh, in movement turns. Each movement turn is going to be one player's movement turn and then the opponent's movement turn. Somebody will be announced for setting up first. They alternate until the battle begins. Now, at the beginning of your movement turn, before moving, you have to roll two dice. And if your combat command on the uh, chart is lower than the dice roll, uh, if I want to move those units, I have to drop their, their command rating by a point. just as if the battle had started. Uh, alternatively, I can kind of hold off. Some Bataglia don't start on the map. In this scenario, this is all that starts on the map, uh, but have to kind of wander in. And uh, You don't need order points to move things during this phase. Everything can move, but they can never move adjacent to the enemy. And this is going to terminate if a player on his own turn declares that he wants to activate uh, one of his Bataglia, which is not in reserve, and the Capitano gets his order points as normal. This is going to be the basic activation, and the game starts under the normal rules. Uh, the Capitano counter receives a first activation marker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at least one unit in this Bataglia must receive an attack or krika, uh in order, uh, or a fire order. So you can't start the game until you're ready to hit. Um, if units are not already on the map, they can be entered at any point during the battle from that point, from that time on. Uh, in reserve, Bataglia can move in the movement turns before the battle, but then they but they maintain their in reserve status, and the rules for their activation in the historical uh, scenario will apply once the scenario starts. So this really isn't here. I want to keep the actual units that are in reserve marked that way. Uh, and every scenario indicates a number of movement turns after which march fatigue is possible. After that number of turns. Uh, if the battle has not begun yet, the movement turn markers are placed back on the first position of the operations track. Um, and then they're tracked from there as usual, but when you're rolling to see whether you can move units for free, uh, you add the value of the movement turn at that point. So I'd be starting, you know, here, I'd, first turn we'd move, second turn we'd move, let's say third turn. Uh, we can move, and after the third turn, it, it uh, becomes 
that's it becomes fatigue worthy then we move to here and now every time i move my die rolls to see if i start losing command points are at plus one plus two plus three from then on uh, to kind of keep us from spending the whole game maneuvering so that's about all there is to the base rules for the game uh, i'm really looking forward to giving this first scenario a try i'm planning on doing all of them no question there uh, <laughs> but yeah this is uh this is very exciting for me